So far, the blockade has cost Ukraine $400 million of import. So it seems like there is not much of pure economic interest in that, but also political. It is impossible to wage a war against one of the world's biggest armies, as Ukraine has done against Russia, without the support of the U.S. It's highly likable that the conflict will repeat all over and over again. Ukraine has to be robust, economically, socially, politically, institutionally. Hi, my name is Elina Hrytsenko. I'm an international relations analyst, and this is Talking Substance, where the true essence of issues is uncovered. And today, my special guest is Jock Mendoza Wilson, a joint chairman of British Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce, and we're going to cover several important issues uh, concerning Ukraine's future. We're going to talk about Ukraine's uh, Ukraine and EU trade agreement. We're going to talk about Ukraine energetic infrastructure and energetic sector. We're also going to talk to cover some political and security issues. So welcome to the studio. Elena, it's great to be here. Thank you for asking me. And let's get straight to the topic that we uh, are going to discuss today, which is some obviously commercial commercial things. The hot topic of these days is the EU and Ukraine trade regime. So the EU's preferential trade regime with Ukraine has been in effect since uh, June 2022. So it's been, uh, it's been happening for almost two years now. And there has been introduced the suspension of import quotas and some custom duties for Ukraine's production, particularly sensitive agricultural production. Yeah. But due to the dissatisfaction of uh, the European farmers, in particular of in those countries who are neighboring Ukraine, so Poland, Romania, Hungary, uh, the European Commission decided to introduce some temporary restrictions for some types of agricultural products for Ukraine. Uh, so, and this week there have been some developments in this liberalization regime yeah. with Ukraine. So yeah. can we please elaborate a little bit for those people who do not follow sure, the Sure, who kind of maybe new to the subject, yeah, because it is quite complex. Complex but important. I'll try and, I'll try and do the, you know, the simple version that's really easy for everybody. You know, after the, the, the war started in uh, February 2022, Ukraine is a huge exporter of products, agricultural products, most notably, but also other raw materials like steel and iron ore and so on. Uh, and those are predominantly, they were exported by, via the Black Sea. But as we know, at the start of the war, essentially the trade routes were closed. The Black Sea was closed to commercial shipping. So suddenly Ukraine has a big problem. It still wants to produce all these products. It needs to produce the products so that its economy can prosper and be able to fight the war but the mechanism to export them is closed. You can't use the ports any longer. And at that point, the EU, uh, I think, wonderfully stepped in very quickly and immediately liberalised trade for Ukraine. And what that meant was that land corridors were opened up. So these land corridors, either by road or by rail, were opened up to Ukraine's near neighbours. The most important of these was Poland and Romania, but also there were exports going out th down into Bulgaria, through Slovakia and through Hungary. And so at one, in one swoop, if you like, all of the quotas and tariffs were removed so Ukraine could, products could be exported. Now, that worked very well, but as we saw, uh, in the, and an agreement was signed at that point and then it was extended uh, through to uh, another agreement signed in 2023 in June. And then a current agreement is due to expire uh, on the 5th of June 2024. What we've seen, though, is that in Ukraine's near neighbours, European Union neighbours, there have been significant protests from farming communities. And the, the problem for, for us here in Ukraine is that that led to them blocking the borders. Right. And so it made it very difficult then to move any cargo through those borders. Primarily, the people blocking the borders, there have been two groups at different times. There have been farmers, but there's also been truckers, mm -hmm. uh, European truckers. Say, And in both cases, uh, they're saying, look, we understand Ukraine needs our help, but unfortunately, this is damaging our European businesses. 
and we're against this and we want our governments to do something to stop this. So we entered into, between Ukraine and the European Union, a period of ne negotiation that started round about uh, December of last year, and that was to find a new mechanism that would both be fair to Ukraine in terms of allowing Ukraine to export its goods, while at the same time trying to protect the interests of those farmers in those countries that neighbour Ukraine. And what happened this week, why it's news this week, is that uh, on Monday there was a decision taken in the Parliament, uh, together with the Parliament, the Commission, and the permanent representatives of EU members to introduce a new mechanism that will take play, that will be introduced uh, from uh, the 6th of June this year and try and solve the problems that exist on the border. And that's where we are. Right. Well, that actually sounds like a compromise because anyway, there was um, that liberalization of trade regime with Ukraine was basically an extraordinary precedent. There was a step of a, of a sign of a goodwill from, yeah. the, from the EU. But at the same time, it seems like this mechanism um, is not very much in favor of Ukraine because Ukraine is going to lose an, extra an extremely huge amount of money. Under, with these restrictions? Well, I think we can we look at it economically. What, right. what have been the problems for Ukraine? So, so far, the blockade has cost Ukraine $400 million of imports. So goods have not been able to come in that we need here in this country. They've been blocked at the border. So that's had an economic impact. The second economic impact is the mechanism. So the new mechanism has got three new elements in it mm -hmm. that are designed to protect the interest of European Union right. farmers. Mm -hmm. So th the majority of the concern is over imports of grain and other sensitive agricultural products like poultry, right. honey, mm -hmm. eggs, maize uh, and oats. And so the new mechanism has three elements. The first one is that the EU will closely monitor prices. So there's a far more intensive monitoring of prices and volumes crossing over from Ukraine into Europe. The second aspect um, is what's known as um, a, a autonomous measure. And the autonomous measure is that if import prices go very low mm -hmm. and they, are, they affect the markets of those countries that Ukraine is exporting its products through, then those countries individually or collectively can call for the implementation of a review and of increased tariffs. And they can call, before the, that sort of mechanism was there, but this time the period in which it could be called is down from 21 to 14 days. So it's seen as being a rapid response mechanism uh, to be able to equalise prices if it seems as though European farmers are being undercut by Ukrainian imports. And then the third measure is that, which is perhaps the most dramatic immediately for Ukraine, mm -hmm. and this one is rather complex, it's a bit, what it is is that the average import levels were based on two years of imports, 2022 and 2023. In the new mechanism, they've added in imports in the first half of 2021, mm -hmm. the period before the war started. Right. So obviously there were less imports into those countries of that period. So that depresses the average volume figure. What does that mean for Ukraine? It actually means that Ukraine will, in essence, lose about $330 million mm -hmm. uh, of trade as a consequence of the new mechanism. And that's clearly, well, that may be beneficial for European farmers. Right. That's not good news for Ukraine. But as you said in the introduction, it's a compromise. And having this deal is better than not having the deal. Right, exactly. But it seems like uh, the Polish farmers are still not quite uh, feel the satisfaction from this compromise because they still keep you know, keep on uh, blocking three checkpoints on the border with Ukraine. So it seems like there is no, there is not much of pure economic interest in that, but also political. So there is also a question of how. Uh, and will uh, the mechanism be revised after the election to the European Parliament? I think that's a really great point is, yeah, the, the headline uses it's a blockade about Ukraine imports, but it's not only 
about Ukrainian imports. It's also about domestic politics inside European Union countries. Uh, and in Poland's case, the farmers were concerned about Ukrainian imports, but they're also uh, concerned about the uh, the imposition of costs on their business as a result of the European Union's Green Deal. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so while one problem for them has been solved, potentially, the question of Ukrainian imports and import tariffs, the second question of the Green Deal remains open. And we're in a political season. Mm -hmm. The Polish election, local elections finished last week uh, and were very hard fought. Right. And the whole protest movement was part of that. And now we move into a period where the European elections will take place in June, the elections for the European Parliament. And farmers want to try and place pressure on European Union politicians, Polish and others in other European countries to address questions about prices and costs and tariffs, some of them related to the Green Deal in the European Union, in these forthcoming elections. So we're not going to see the protest movement from farmers, which has happened in Romania, it's happened in Hungary, it's happened in Poland, and it's happened in France. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And so this yeah. issue is not going away. And I think we will find amongst rural and agricultural communities that this question uh, of uh, the Green Deal and the cost it places on agriculture is going to be at the front and centre of the forthcoming European parliamentary elections. Right. And going back to uh, those restrictions, uh, you mentioned that uh, the volumes will be uh, being monitored, yeah. but not the quality, not the standards of, yeah. of the of the product. Well, there, there are checks and balances on the quality, mm -hmm. and Polish farmers have complained about the quality of Ukrainian products. I, I'm not I don't know the details of that, but okay. I'm not necessarily supportive of it. Ukraine is one of the finest producers of agricultural products in the world. You know, complaining about the quality and the price is just simply trying to prevent Ukrainian exports entering into their marketplace and, and, and cut it up and undercut them. What will have to happen in the future, of course, is that Ukraine, through its process of the membership of the European Union, Ukrainian farm, farming products of all types, all agricultural products, will need to meet the European sanitary and quality standards. And that's a progression. Right. That's a progression that we will see over the next few years. And that's a challenge uh, for Ukrainian industry, uh, for Ukrainian agribusiness, uh, to make sure it meets those standards. But I have to say, many of the larger agribusinesses already meet those standards because mm -hmm. they've invested to ensure they could because they see the EU as an extraordinarily important market for them in the future. Speaking of the future, uh, there's a question of... While we are observing such sensitive reaction of European farmers on the Ukrainian uh, produce now, when Ukraine is not yet the EU member, how Ukraine can potentially deal with such dissatisfaction once Ukraine enters the Union? So well, there's going to be... <laughs> There will be hard to find a compromise once again and to provide any restriction measures when, you, when, you, when Ukraine is the EU member. I, I really think that this is a big question. The, 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 this, the, the current question of tariffs is a localized issue for a period of time. Mm -hmm. The big issue in the future is how does the European Union, which has a very competitive agricultural sector, but it's also very protected. The internal market of the EU is highly protected from imports from other sources to protect European Union farmers. So how does the European Union common agricultural policy, how does it integrate Ukraine? Because, you know, Ukraine is, uh, we live here and we see it, this is an agricultural powerhouse. The climate, the quality of soil, the size of the country, the diversity of the products it can produce. This is an enormous challenge for European farmers. If Ukraine, and in this case it's not an if, it's a when, because the agreement is already in print there that Ukraine will be a member. So how do you accommodate a large agricultural producer like Ukraine into the European uh, farming infrastructure? And we're going to see you know, considerably more discussions, negotiations, and indeed very possibly protests 
as Ukraine makes its way to full integration with the European Union. And, and I think what we see now with these protests are essentially just the warning shots of what will be uh, a detailed discussion over the next four to five years while Ukraine makes that journey. And I, it's going to have radical change for the, for the European Union's common agricultural policy. And people might think common agricultural policy, that's not that important. It's the largest single area of expenditure inside the European Union budget. Mm -hmm. So it's crucial. It is absolutely at the top of the EU's mission. So this is a, a significant challenge, not just for European Union farmers, right. but also for uh, the Ukrainian government and Ukrainian farmers to make sure that they meet the high standards that Europe's going to insist on right. before mm -hmm. it opens its, its markets, uh, giving you know, Ukraine unfettered access. But that will happen. But it will be a rocky road over the next four to five years. But it will happen. Well, anyway, it seems like uh, the EU membership question is not purely, again, not purely economic uh, interest. It's also a political issue because the EU membership is not, seems like it's not happening until the war is over. So back when, the, when that happens, when the war is over and we can actually uh, make some forecast about EU membership, the terms of the EU, Ukraine's EU membership, probably the Black Sea Corridor will be working um, at that moment when, when the war is over, when there is no danger of uh, missile attacks from Russia, from Russia, which is actually keep on trading grain and agriculture products through the Black Sea still. Uh, so I guess considering that there will be an open, free and safe Black Sea and Ukraine will be able to uh, to export its agricultural goods uh, to the world through the Black Sea, there will be not that much of a problem, I guess. Yeah, I think that you really, sometimes we, we get over over detailed about economic problems. The biggest cha challenge for the Ukrainian economy in time of war is, our, is market access. And uh, the, you know, the, U the Ukrainian military have done a phenomenal job over the last two years in deterring Russia's Black Sea fleet. As we know, there's a third of that fleet are now turned into submarines and sit at the bottom of the Black Sea. That has a real practical benefit. What we've seen is that Ukraine now is able to export again through the uh, ports of the Black Sea with the Odessa port and others working. Um, and I was looking at the figures before we had this mm -hmm. chat today. And it, from this month forward, it looks as though the cargoes shipping through Black Sea will be up again to about 6 million tonnes per month. Mm -hmm. That is of enormous importance for Ukraine uh, because Ukraine is really an export oriented economy. We export our agri products, we export our steel, we export our iron ore, um, it, it is, and we export other rare earths and minerals. And so be, those are mostly shipped by sea. Mm -hmm. So this step forward in returning to at least a channel of navigation through the Black Sea is crucial for the country's economic uh, future. And I, I always remind people that, you know, we're sitting here in Kiev and it, sometimes war can get very kinetic. But equally importantly is the economic war because Ukraine and Ukrainian business and citizens are constantly under an economic bombardment from Russia. So the sorting of the Black Sea uh, is, is, a, is fantastic news uh, for all businesses in Ukraine who are export orientated, which is many of them. Russia keeps attacking Ukrainian territory with missiles. So there is a question of how can Ukrainian economy withstand the damages for this energetic infrastructure? Uh, that's a, a really great question. Now, I'll, I'm going to sort of say with my other hat on, I'm also Director of International and Investor Relations for System Capital Management Group, which is Ukraine, Ukraine's largest financial and industrial group. And inside that business is Ukraine's largest energy business, which is DTEC, which has suffered terribly. Right. Um, from the uh, attacks from uh, Russian missiles and drones uh, since the war began. Uh, but the attacks recently have had a significant impact. Uh, I think it, the report reported correctly is that about 80% of DTEC's thermal energy provision uh, for Ukraine has been damaged during these recent missile attacks. Uh, now, DTEC has been, along with the whole of the Ukrainian energy sector, I must say, 
It's not a DTEC specific answer. It's about the whole energy sector has been extraordinarily resilient. You know, much of the assets were destroyed in 2022 and then uh, as 2022, 2023 winter and then rebuilt. And now again, they've come under ta attack. And I think w we here in Kiev, mostly the lights have been on. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot about power workers who've gone out and worked in really tough conditions to ensure that our power supplies remained on. The next challenge we face, again, is this rebuilding of the energy assets that have been destroyed. And I think there are three factors here that will help us in the future. Firstly, we need to have access to the type of equipment that we need to rebuild these. Mm -hmm. Now, that means we need help from our European partners and international partners to be able to find these transformers and switchboards and generators, the parts and pieces, and be able to bring them quickly into Ukraine. So that will require an international effort. And that has already begun. The second aspect is, you know, it's not just about equipment. We need money to do this. Right. And you, you're probably aware that most international institutions, most donors, will not provide any finance of any sort for any reconstruction or construction of plants which use coal. Mm -hmm. And what we need here is for them to temporarily suspend that restriction, given the special circumstances here in Ukraine, mm -hmm. so that capital can flow in, so goods can be bought and reconstruction can take place at pace. And I should add, when these assets are being restructured, restructured, we always try and put in mechanisms, defence mechanisms, to try and support them in attack. And the third aspect, and why is this happening now, why has March been the month of great attacks on the Ukrainian energy system, is because um, our air defences are depleted. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have enough units to be mm -hmm. able to cover uh, crucial energy structures in Ukraine, and we don't have enough missiles right. to place in the units we already have. So immediately providing Ukraine with enhanced ground-to-air defense systems mm -hmm. and the missiles required is essential. And that's why the big discussions in Washington that we all talk about here in Ukraine, wh wherever we go, whichever, you know, whichever job we're in, we're always wondering what will happen in the United States and will that 60 billion come? That 60 billion isn't mythical. That's about people's lives and homes and energy and jobs. So we mm -hmm. hope they reach eventually the right conclusion. So you're saying it is possible to lure some investment to Ukraine while the war is happening because it seems like, you know, obviously there are huge risks for the investors to come to Ukraine, even if we are provided with air defense systems and even if the sky is protected. Um, well, if we look at specifically about this reconstruction of the energy system, this will be grants and loans specifically to restore vital mm -hmm. thermal energy. Uh, and, and that does need to take place. I think there's a different question, which is maybe the one you want to go on to, which is about how, how or why and why should people invest right. in Ukraine mm -hmm. in the time of war? And that's a different question. It requires like, different mechanisms. Uh, and I, I would say that, you know, let, let's make sure we have the right tools to fix the energy question now so that we're in a strong position come next winter. And in terms of the bigger investment climate, uh, Ukraine remains a really interesting place to invest. Some investors do come in, but they tend to focus on the West, mm -hmm. the West of Ukraine. There's still uh, investment going on in the agricultural sector. But what stops investors, what just holds them back is, is fear over uh, the outcome of the war. Right. And uh, one of the mechanisms which we're going to need now and in the future to encourage investment in Ukra into Ukraine is what's called conflict risk insurance. So, you know, if you're a Western company and someone says we should build a logistics center mm -hmm. on the west of Ukraine, which, by the way, is a good investment at the moment because of the move to mm -hmm. road and rail mm -hmm. transport, someone's going to say, well, what happens if it's hit by a rocket? And that might be the end of the conversation. The board may not go further because they fear the loss of the asset as a result of war. So what you need is an underpinning mechanism mm -hmm. of uh, conflict risk insurance. Often you combine it with political risk. So you have political conflict risk and political risk insurance. And that will probably be the bedrock mm -hmm. of uh, 
investment which will come in. It needs that in place. And that's something which the Ukrainian government and the international institutions, led in part by the United Kingdom, which has an amazing insurance marketplace, are looking at right now. So I think we will see that. Maybe it will be brought to the fore during the uh, Ukraine Reconstruction Conference. Uh, the next edition of that takes place in June in mm -hmm. Germany. And I know that the German team are working on that question. And so I think we see progress in that area, and that will be important. The next aspect, of course, is affordable access to capital for all businesses, not just for international investors coming in, but also for domestic mm -hmm. Ukrainian business. Uh, I think that when, you, when we think about Ukraine, we think about foreign money coming in. But, you know, my experience of living and working here is that it's large Ukrainian businesses and businesses who might be international, mm -hmm. but are already invested in Ukraine, who will be the driving motor for the recovery after mm -hmm. the war. Okay. It's those businesses that already understand Ukraine, understand the risk and are ready to com commit money. I mean, my own business that I work for, SCM, has invested $1 billion this year mm -hmm. in Ukraine, in the belief uh, in the long-term future of the country and the economy. And there are others who are doing similarly. So I think Ukrainian businesses will drive forward the recovery. Okay. Mm -hmm. but we need into access to foreign capital. And that's particularly true in energy, where we want to make this energy transition mm -hmm. from the carbon economy right. to the renewables. And the renewables are the future of the Ukrainian energy sector. But we need to both maintain or, or retain our current carbon base well, we make that transition and we need the transition and we need investment into new renewable energy in Ukraine, particularly in wind and solar okay. and in the future mm -hmm. in modular nuclear mm -hmm. to build the new energy system. And, make, and, and as we know, we're already connected with the EU energy marketplace and that is our future as a great supplier of renewable energy to the European Union. That was actually my next question oh. about the renewables, right? Because uh, what I uh, what I think about the energy sector and how Ukraine can uh, protect and secure the energy sector, I'm thinking about the example of India. So a huge country, one and a half billion people. So obviously they're not able to provide energy using just one type of energy. Like uh, people usually criticize India for buying oil and coal from Russia while the Indian government say, hello, we have the huge population in the world, we cannot actually provide the energy using uh, using only renewables. At the same time, India is diversifying its sources, so India is working on both. So all tradition, uh, all tradition uh, coal and, and oil, and at the same time, they are uh, collaborating with different countries all over the world on their renewables and they're building solar farms and they use wind energy and uh, marine energy and stuff like that. So my question actually was if it is, if Ukraine has potential and resources and if it actually possible to secure its energy sector by diversifying the ways of providing energy so using renewables using green energy well i think i'm going to take your last comment first which is it, it, it ukraine must diversify okay. uh, its energy economy by moving towards renewables uh, that is the the future of the country's energy system uh, that transition is already taking place. Uh, you know, you're seeing significant investment before the war anyway, in the Ukrainian renewable sector, in wind farms and in solar. Uh, but you're also seeing examination of new hydro projects in Ukraine. Uh, we know we've had significant damage to our hydro energy uh, system. That's gonna require significant investment to restore that. Uh, but hydro will be a few, part of the future, wind will be part of the future, uh, solar will be part of the future. And I think, you know, if I looked at the figures before coming in today, if you looked at the end of March in terms of where was the energy produced, the largest single sector of production of energy in Ukraine has been for generations and continues to be nuclear. And so 58%, uh, that was a last week in March figure, of the energy produced for Ukraine was produced by nuclear. So what we need to think about is how do we transition from these old nuclear stations to a new nuclear. And I think that that pathway, again, it's a, it's a green energy play, will be using small uh, SMRs, small, uh, medium, small and medium-sized reactors, which are quite interesting because you can take them 
and they can be placed in the areas where you already have the other energy infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So okay. small modular reactors, mm -hmm. SMRs, that can be taken and placed where you currently have a power hub uh, mm -hmm. and then replace the existing source that might be, for example, a coal-fired power station. And, and in terms of security, there's an interesting play when you think about renewables mm -hmm. and uh, small modular reactors, is that these are diversified, low-carbon networks. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, Ukraine is being hit by Russian missiles because Rus these power stations presently were built when this was part of the Soviet Union. The Russians know the location of every single Ukrainian power plant and they can be targeted. But imagine that you diversify that so that your generation sites are across this huge country. And it's very hard. You can't take out a wind farm. You can take out a turbine. It's much harder to take out the whole wind farm mm -hmm. or a solar farm here and a wind farm here. So this distribution geographically of power and the change of power source will also really stabilize Ukraine's energy system in the long term, given that, you know, when you look forward, you cannot see living uh, next to you. you will always, we will always feel a risk right. from mm -hmm. Russia, not even after this war comes to an end. We will always feel a risk from Russia. And everything we do in the future in terms of our in infrastructure has to be designed with a recognition that we need to be sustainable when we have a difficult neighbor next to us. Yeah, but it also comes back to the question if the investors want to come here to Ukraine when there's always going to be a menace, when there's going to be a Damocles sword hanging over Ukraine. Well, I think if we have two factors coming together, there's a huge desire to mm -hmm. invest in Ukraine and Ukrainian infrastructure in a post-war environment. There will be significant amounts of capital available that will come in. Renewables is an area where Ukraine has proven to be successful in constructing and operating. So if you then underpin that mm -hmm. uh, with the political and conflict risk insurance that economically takes out the question of losing your business as a result of conflict because you've insured it, then I think we will see investors come in. And I think that the future of renewables in Ukraine is, is secure. Right. So there's a question of um, security guarantees. So how we, you, so Ukraine has to ensure and secure its business environment. And it is possible to do that through security and political guarantees from other countries. NATO could be potentially one of, uh, of ways out of this situation, but it seems like NATO is not happening anytime soon because of the uh, constant constant danger coming from, from the Russian Federation, which is not going anywhere either. So there's a question of how Ukraine can find potential alternatives to NATO. Either those can be security guarantees from different countries, from European countries. Those security guarantees that are unlike of those that have been already signed, because those are not particularly, so, so those are called security guarantees, but we do understand that those are um, supposed to provide some security in different uh, activities, for example, um, providing weaponry to Ukraine, things, things like that. But it doesn't seem that Ukraine is close to finding allies who will be ready to protect Ukraine. So there is a question if Ukraine can potentially find an alternative to NATO. Um, I think firstly, it is important that Ukraine considers the different alternatives to NATO. Uh, you know, I, I fully hope that Ukraine will be a member of NATO in the future, and it will be a very useful and constructive member of NATO, because it has the best trained army Uh, it's trained in battle. It has a uh, great military resource here now. Nonetheless, that's going to take time. Uh, we've got the next NATO summit coming up in Washington uh, on the 9th, 11th of July. There will be no agreement signed there for Ukraine's membership. Right. And there'll be no membership of Ukraine for NATO until the end of the war and possibly even after that. So I think you're right. Ukraine's got to look at what different options are available. And I, I think that in, in that context, uh, and being British, so I'm going to use my BUCC hat here, you know, uh, 
The United Kingdom signed a, a strategic partnership with Ukraine back in 2020 before war started. Uh, Rishi Sunak was here in February and signed a more detailed 100-year partnership, he claimed, with Ukraine, which covers both economic and military questions. So I think what you need to look at and what Ukraine is looking at is which countries can you genuinely rely upon uh, in the long term to support the sovereignty of your nation state, both in terms of supporting your military and supporting your economy. That is a economy. question because every country thinks about its its national interests and that's completely understandable because nobody is ready to protect you against a nuclear power, which is the Russian Federation, because it's not going anywhere. It's always going to be there bordering neighboring Ukraine. So there's a question, which country is really ready to do that so then you get into the really detailed question, yeah, which is, so if you think military security is about, or your, the treaty is about boots on the ground, there will be no boots on the ground treaties signed with any country, uh, regrettably. That will not happen. So you can exclude that from the agreements that will be discussed. And so then you get to what are the, who will actually provide resource and the type of resource when we need it. And the ultimate answer to that is, of course, the United States of America, uh, as it has been for Israel, as it has really been also for, the, for Ukraine. It is impossible to wage a war against one of the world's biggest armies, as Ukraine has done against Russia, without the support of the US. So you would look at a f detailed treaty with the US for support for Ukraine, and then look at other partners who are can-do partners, and that's people like the Brits and the Poles and the Lithuanians and the Baltic states and the Swedes uh, and the Finns and the Danes, and to a lesser extent, the, du the Dutch. Now, what I'm saying here is that you form a coalition of the winning, of the willing, people who are really ready to help. And if you look at NATO structure, there is a mechanism um, it's called the Joint Expeditionary Force. Mm -hmm. It was established uh, in uh, the NATO summit in Newport in 2014. And then the first JEF, as it's called, Joint Expeditionary Force, JEF for short, was set up in 2015. And its, its objective was to defend, provide a rapid reaction response to northern, an, an attack on northern Europe. It doesn't say Russia, but it means Russia. And that's already in place and operating and resourced. And it's a structure that brings together NATO countries and non-NATO countries in an alliance to, prefer, to protect common interests. And it's seen as being a force that can deploy rapidly. Now, Ukraine has been invited, was invited to the summit last year, which took place in Sweden. And as a result of that, it's, it will... Act, come as an observer to the next two series of trainings which will take place on uh, in 24, later 24 and 25. And that type of mechanism, a joint expeditionary force, which has a rapid reaction, it's possible you could create a, you know, Jeff Plus or a Jeff Ukraine, which would both be ready to supply support, logistics, ammunition, and arms to a Ukraine under attack. It would be up to the, uh, it's unlikely that would ever be inside that a boots on the ground question, but it is not beyond the realms of possibility in the future. Once we move beyond this conflict into the next phase, that that might be possible. So I think there are mechanisms out there that could be looked at, Ukraine is looking at it, um, but whatever happens, it's good to have those in place. It gives you leverage to persuade people they must do something now and that they must help Ukraine. But one shouldn't, as a Ukrainian or someone like me living and working here, one shouldn't think that it's going to mean that another country's army will come to your defence. I can't see the circumstances at present where that would happen. Yeah, there's always a political issue, I think, uh, always a... Um a human factor, so to speak, when there is a government that perceives the situation in one way, but you cannot actually secure that in the future there will be the government with the same perception. So there is always a question like, today we see the Baltic countries giving up huge amounts of weaponry in favor of Ukraine. We see the Scandinavian countries uh, providing air defense systems to Ukraine, but it is hard, I believe, to make sure that in the future 
the governments will look at this conflict in the same way because it is highly likable that the conflict will repeat all over and over again because it doesn't really matter who is on top of the Russian political establishment. It's the strategic culture and is it a mentality and it's not going to change anytime soon toward, I mean, from, from the Russian side towards Ukraine. So it's hard to make sure if we just, for example, negotiate with European countries apart from the United States. So with the United States, it's also quite quite complicated, for example, because you cannot actually predict what's going to happen if Donald Trump comes back to the White House. You can Indeed. possibly predict his intentions toward Ukraine and toward the Russian-Ukraine war, but you cannot predict his concrete actions and concrete steps towards Ukraine. You can predict another crisis within the transatlantic relations. You can predict a crisis within NATO, considering if Donald Trump comes back to the, to the White House, considering his, his perception of NATO, considering Emmanuel Macron's ambitions to create a, a whole new European army that will be in, independent from the American, the American part of the NATO. So it's really hard to, for example, if we negotiate with different European countries, that sometime in the future they can be ready to provide aid to Ukraine the same as they as they are doing now. So it's really hard to predict that perception in the future if they are ready to do that in the future, not standing by Ukraine and not going to war uh, with Ukraine against Russia if another invasion happens again. But just to secure the same amount of aid, for example, because again, in countries that are providing help for Ukraine, they have their own national interests yeah. and they are coming from, uh, they, they are thinking about the current geopolitical situation, which is, which can change drastically in the future. That's a really kind of broad-ranging and difficult <laughs> question to answer, Alina. But let's let's kind of break it down into component parts. I think the first thing is you're right. Countries have their own domestic national interests, and that drives their decision making more than anything else, as we've seen in the present environment. So, what does that mean for a country like Ukraine? It means, firstly, Ukraine has to be robust, economically, socially, politically, institutionally. Because uh, the, the, the greater the strength of Ukraine, the more likely people are likely to support it, but also the less likely others have to undermine it. So firstly, focus on, on, on a successful, strong Ukraine, recognizing that for the next 20 years, Ukraine will need to put 4 to 5 percent of GDP into its security and defense in order to ensure that it's capable of defending itself. Uh, secondly, treaties do matter. Co Governments change, but it's not so often that the principles and self-interest of a country changes. If we look at those countries who've stepped up to help Ukraine now, those are those countries who understand the Russian risk. They are part of the risk profile of Russia. Whether it's the Baltics, the Scandinavians or the Poles, they understand the risk. Beyond that, as a Brit, we understand the risk because we've had at least 15 assassinations carried out by Russian Secret Service on our territory. And we now understand that Russia is a risk to our state and we are up there, the Brits, as perhaps the second uh, most detested country by the Russians after the United States. Consequently, those are a coalition of the willing. Sign treaties with those because your interest is aligned with their self-interest. And that is the most likely long-term solution um, to support and success. So just catch the chance, right, at the yeah, moment now. where it's available. Do it right now, okay. because this is the moment. The, the narrative inside those countries, I, I was in London until about, well, I, I was in London a week ago. It, inside those countries, the narrative now about is recognition of the Russian threat. So this is a great opportunity. Do those deals, sign those treaties with the people who are ready to support you, because they are the ones who in the hour of need are most likely to come to your assistance. Um, then I think we have an interesting mechanism coming forward uh, in uh, the Washington meeting uh, for NATO. And that's the one that was put forward uh, just a couple of, uh, well, about a week ago, actually, by uh, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. And that is the $100 billion bond for Ukraine. Uh, 
So making sure that all NATO members, all 32 countries contribute or agree to contribute to a five-year, $100 billion bond for Ukraine. Why is that important? Because if things do change in America, and you did talk about the possibility that President Trump could come to power again, that's indeed possible. So what you need to do is also think, what would the world be like if that happened? And ensure you have different plans in place. And if American funding to Ukraine stops, it is a crisis. But if another source of funding has at least been put in place, it may be the crucial funding that protects Ukraine's sovereignty. So I think the 100, million, the 100 billion bond is really important. Uh, it sends two messages. It says to the Russians, look at this. These countries are backing Ukraine not just until next year. So the Russians are waiting for an American presidency of Trump. That might not be enough for them. So we've got $100 billion coming in, committed to Ukraine for military support over a period of five years. That tells Russia, it sends a huge message that the West is ready to back Ukraine. So both the access to the funds and the message the funds send themselves will be significant. So I hope that that will get through. And that's the sort of deal, the real politics of things that can happen in advance of, we hope, Ukraine's ultimate NATO membership. Well, the future seems to be brighter. <laughs> I <laughs> hope it will be brighter. Yeah, but, you know, like anything now. in the future, we wait and see. Okay. Thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for being with Talking Substance. We Today we talked with Jock Mendoza-Wilson, Joint Chairman of British Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce. Please subscribe to the channel not to miss all the next episodes.